Hello and welcome to Addressing the COVID-19 Crisis, an open forum webinar series for pharmacists, pharmacy technicians, and student pharmacists. I'm Michael Hogue, your host for today, the Dean and Professor of Loma Linda University School of Pharmacy, and I'm the current president of the American Pharmacists Association. We know that all of you have been very, very busy in the last uh, weeks, either preparing to administer doses of COVID vaccine or you've been administering COVID vaccine, we thought it was important that we take just a moment to address some myths and facts related to uh, all of the things related to COVID because there is a lot circulating out there right now on social media uh, and even in the normal consumer uh, media. And we wanna make sure that you're hearing the facts from the experts that uh, know really what the situation is with the various therapies that are out there for COVID and also for the vaccine. So uh, we're really pleased this week to have with us our internal panel of experts. First, Dan Zlot. He is the Senior Vice President of Education and Business Development for the American Pharmacists Association and joined APHA after 10 years uh, working with the National Institutes of Health in oncology and uh, immunology. And so we're really pleased to have Dan here to, to um, uh, bust up some myths related to uh, drug therapies and, and the diseases itself. And so we're glad to have him. And then we also have Mitch Rothholz. Mitch joins us every week as Chief of Governance and State Affiliates for APHA. He is a longtime uh, lead expert on APHA staff with uh, governmental agencies related to vaccines and works very closely with the CDC and a variety of other entities to make sure that pharmacists have the latest information about vaccines. And so Mitch is gonna take our questions today about vaccines. So we're excited to hear from them. And then also we'll have Elisa Bernstein, our Senior Vice President of Pharmacy Practice and Government Affairs for APHA, who will join us to talk about some late breaking news uh, out of HHS today, uh, later in our broadcast. But we'll also address any questions that you have about legal issues related to COVID-19 or uh, agency policy related topics that may arise today. So we've got a lot to talk about. Uh, we are in fact offering continuing education for today's program. We don't do that every time, but we are today. So for those of you who are joining us live uh, and are watching this in real time, you're eligible to receive continuing education. And if you're joining this in a delayed broadcast, the CE is only available for those who are joining us live. There are no disclosures that our speakers have as ter in terms of conflicts of interest today. And our uh, uh, CE activity is a knowledge-based activity from ACPE. Our learning objectives today are to identify the common myths of COVID, discuss those myths, and talk about the latest information on COVID-19. And hopefully you'll find that quite informative. Now, after we have uh, 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 finish up with some introductory comments here to make sure that you all understand how we're moving forward with the webinar, uh, we'll do a back and forth conversation with Dan Slott and Mitch Rothholz about some myths that are commonly coming up here related to the disease and the vaccine. Uh, we'll have an open forum for you to ask questions. And I want to just uh, mention to you now that on your GoToWebinar control panel, there is a questions tab. You can enter questions into that tab now. And in fact, some of you who join us every week are aware of that and have already started entering your questions. Thank you. We want your questions. Uh, go ahead and submit them. And we will cover as many of your questions as we have time for in the hour that we're here together today. Uh, I'll be asking your questions on your behalf in order to be able to get to as many questions as possible. We have hundreds of people joining us, so I know there are lots of questions and we want to be efficient in getting through as many as we possibly can. Also, this is being recorded, so it will be posted at pharmacist.com in the COVID-19 vaccine resources page. If you have colleagues that you think would benefit from this information, you can direct them to go to pharmacist.com. Just click on the COVID-19 resources page and you'll be able to access this recording uh, sometime tomorrow. And also to let you know that the handouts tab has a copy of today's handouts. All the links that are in the handout are active and will take you directly to the website that you need in order to be able to get more information about the subjects that we're talking about today. So 
I think what we're going to do now, uh, audience, I want to prep you because I've got a lot of polling questions today, and we're going to ask you to click on your screen and give us your best answer to these questions. So the first question that we're going to ask today, and I, I'll ask our panelists to go ahead and join me on the screen, both Mitch and Dan, uh, and Elisa as well. Um, if a person had COVID-19 infection, they do not need to be vaccinated against COVID-19. Is that true or is that false? If a person had COVID-19 infection, they do not need to be vaccinated against COVID-19. Tell us about this. What are your thoughts? I thank you all for jumping right in there. I'm glad everybody's awake this morning. We're getting a great response rate. Let's see what the results are of this poll. Well, 98% of you said false, and I think you got that right. Mitch, why don't you give us a little bit more detail about this? I think you may have a couple of slides. Okay, thanks, Michael. Um, so the answer again was, was false. Um, again, what we're looking at is uh, what impact the severity of getting COVID-19 has on an individual, um, and the possibility of reinfection, is, there is possible uh, for reinfection. But again, looking at the benefit versus the risk, CDC has said that getting a vaccine, even if you've been sick with COVID before, is a recommendation. You sh they should be getting vaccinated against COVID. Um, we don't know how long the immunity protection will um, will last uh, for somebody who who gets who got sick with COVID, um, and so that's a that's one determinant in making this recommendation. We also know that natural immunity. We don't know how long that will last for somebody who. Who got COVID. We also don't know how long the immunity uh, will last from the vaccine. Th that's still being studied. And I have, happen to be a participant in a clinical uh, trial. So it's over two years that we're going to be looking at how long that protection lasts. So the value of getting vaccinated, even if somebody has been ex exposed um, to COVID, has gotten COVID, um, it, the, the benefit versus the risk in this situation. All right, and I think we may have one more slide here uh, related to this. And um, uh, yeah, one of the key things here, Mitch, it's, is about uh, uh, is about waiting until their isolation has been discontinued. Why is that important? So uh, again, we in terms of of um, of getting um, an infection again, even if you've been exposed, um, does it you know ninety days? Um, has been pretty much we don't we don't we know that reinfection is uncommon in the 90 days after the initial infection and so going to that recommendation about getting vaccinated you don't have to get it right away they kind of gave uh, giving kind of a, a 90 day window um, don't don't wait until the last uh, but you've got 90 days so it's so it's, it gives you some time to plan give some time for the individual to get comfortable um, with getting vaccinated so I, I think that they did that deliberately to give you a window of time for getting these individuals vaccinated. Again, they need to be vaccinated, do it within the 90 days after their initial exposure. Yeah, and so just to be clear for our audience and make sure that there's no confusion, the, the CDC doesn't say that there's a mandatory 90-day window period uh, window of waiting that has to happen, uh, but it's uh, advice saying that we know that you may have antibodies for up to 90 days. The one concern with waiting is that I don't know about all of you who are listening today, but I forget sometimes what I'm supposed to be doing. And if I wait too long, I, it might be five months or six months before I finally remember that I need to get vaccinated. So the key here is make sure the individual has recovered fully from their illness and that the criteria have been met for them to discontinue isolation. That's the critical thing. And, and then vaccinate. Uh, don't force people to have to wait 90 days. It's an option. Well, let's go on to our next myth question. We'll put it up on the screen and ask our audience to respond. We get a lot of questions about ivermectin. It's been in the news a lot lately as a treatment. Has Iver, ivermectin has been proven effective for the treatment of COVID-19? Is that a true statement or a false statement regarding ivermectin's proven effectiveness in the treatment of COVID-19? All right, don't be shy. Just click right there on your screen. True or false, we're gathering up your information. All right, let's show the results of our audience. 
I think we've got a pretty wise audience here today. 89% said false. Iver Ivermectin has been proven effective as false. Well, Dan, why don't you uh, tell us about uh, what we know about Ivermectin in terms of uh, treatment of COVID-19? I think it may be one of the hottest things floating through right now on social media related to treatment. Yeah, absolutely. So it, this is really interesting. It's uh, um, something that we saw earlier on in the pandemic um, and probably around June, um, late June, early July, there was a lot of excitement around ivermectin. And lately it seems to have made a resurgence. Uh, and so uh, we'll start with the, the bottom line up front for this, which is uh, it's false. Uh, clinical studies evaluating the use of ivermectin are ongoing. Um, if you do a PubMed search right now and look for uh, COVID-19 and ivermectin, you'll find a lot. There's a ton of information out there, a lot of speculation, uh, and a lot of in vitro data. However, if you limit your search to clinical studies, there's no data out there. So we really have no effective evidence about the use of ivermectin for the treatment, prevention, um, et cetera, of ivermectin in, for the use in, against COVID-19. Additionally, I'll point out that the FDA, we've, this has been in the news so much recently that the FDA actually issued a warning statement uh, updated, uh, they update, issued one early on and they updated it uh, as recently as December of 2020, uh, advising against the use of ivermectin. So uh, the question, of course, is where did all this come from? Um, so if we move on to the next slide, um, really this all started um, because of a publication that came out in late June. And this was an in vitro study looking at what are called Vero H slam cells in vitro. So in case you're wondering what those are, those are African green monkey kidney cells. Um, and so it, it was shown that in African green monkey kidney cells, uh, ivermectin was very effective at preventing the replication and infection of COVID-19 virus. The problem, of course, is that uh, none of us talking and observing today's webinar are African green monkey kidney cells. And so to take that data and extrapolate it out to use in humans is not appropriate. Um, but a lot of that doesn't stop people. And it's interesting, the authors even cautioned in the article, this is exploratory, it needs a lot more research um, before we're ready to move on it. Um, but I think given the excitement and the desire for effective COVID therapies, it really took off and uh, seems to have made a resurgence recently. All right. Well, it seems like you've uh, straightened us out on this particular myth, Dan. I appreciate that. Let's throw up the next question uh, to let everyone respond to. The COVID-19 viral test can detect the new COVID-19 variant. So this is true or false? And um, I think this may be a little tougher question for everybody. Uh, the COVID-19 viral test can detect the new COVID-19 variant. We've been hearing a lot about it in the news. It was identified first in the UK. And of course, now many places in the US have reported the COVID-19 variant. Let's show our results. And I would say that's about as split as an audience can be on a question at 50-50. <laughs> I believe that it can and some believe that it can't. Well, Dan, how about clearing this up for us? What's uh, what's true? Is it true or is it false? Absolutely. So how about this? We'll try to make it as clear as much. Um, the answer is that everybody's right. Um, if you thought it was true, you're right. And if you thought it was false, you're right. Um, the answer is it really depends. Um, there, and this is one where um, we apologize for the trick question. Um, wasn't meant to be a trick question, but uh, sometimes this is the nature of you know clinical reality. So there really isn't a 100% clear cut answer. And whether or not a test will recognize these uh, very COVID uh, mutations, it really depends on two things, the nature of the mutation. So does the mutation cause a change in the protein structure of a surface uh, antigen, the spike protein, et cetera? And how do these tests work? And so uh, if we move on to the next slide, um, one of the things I'll give a, a real world example, uh, when you look at how PCR tests, so these are tests that are looking for the genetic uh, code of the virus. And the way that they work is they have very specific code sequences that they're looking for. Um, and we call those probes. And so if there's a mutation in the probe sequence that the test recognizes, it's quite possible that that test may not be able to recognize a genetic mutation or a variant of COVID-19. Likewise, if you have an antigen test, 
and there was a mutation that somehow affected the protein that is being recognized by the antigen test uh, enough that the antibodies in that antigen test are not able to recognize the antigen uh, from the COVID-19 virus, it's very possible that the uh, test would not be able to pick up the variant. So those are the possibilities. I want to highlight to our audience that that is very, very rare. Uh, the FDA has been monitoring this very, very closely. And to date, uh, they've really only identified three tests that have uh, some that may have been affected. And they're, they're using a lot of um, what we used to call at the NIH weasel words, uh, which are <laughs> words that are designed to say this is not an absolute. Um, it may impact the accuracy of three tests or the ability of those three tests to detect COVID-19 variants. So it is possible, but so far it is extremely, extremely rare. Okay. All right. Well, I think we've got the answer to that one. Let's uh, look at this one now. Individuals who are pregnant, breastfeeding, uh, or immunocompromised should wait to get vaccinated until more data is available. Is that true or false? Individuals who are pregnant, breastfeeding, or immunocompromised should wait to get vaccinated until more data is available. All right, thanks for clicking fast, folks. That's helpful. We'll look at the results now. 73% of you said false, 27% said true. Mitch, our vaccine expert, is going to tell us what the answer is and why. Okay, thank you, Michael. So, <clears throat> individuals who are pregnant or breastfeeding can be administered the COVID vaccine. And that is based on um, people who are pregnant, their increased risk of severe illness if they come, if they contract COVID. And so those risks include um, at pregnancy outcomes such as preterm birth that um, could be impacted. And so as they looked at that, they looked at some animal studies where there was no um, safety concerns that, that were identified, as well as the ongoing human um, evaluations that are going on. And based on what experts know, in terms of believing that the mRNA vaccines are unlikely to pose a risk to pregnant persons or fetuses because the mRNA vaccines are not live vaccines. And I think in a previous um, webinar, Dan went through the whole way that the mRNA um, strand works in the body. Um, so I, I think that that science, that understanding, the, the experiences that have happened to date has led to, to CDC and ACOG, the American College of, of Obstetrics and Gynecology, coming to the recommendation that it's okay for individuals who are pregnant or breastfeeding to get vaccinated with the COVID vaccine, and that there should be a conversation uh, between the patient and their clinical team, um, whether what are the be benefits and the risks of getting the vaccine. Uh, ultimately, it's the patient's choice whether to get the vaccine or not with a discussion, if they have questions with their, their clinician to, to help them make the decision um, that they um, get the vaccine or not. Um, also, the question has popped up um, in several chats in the past in terms of the impact of the vaccine on fertility and sterility. Um, there is no evidence that, that, that supports that claim that the vaccine causes infertility or sterility. I would also just mention there, Mitch, related to this, I heard a great presentation this week by an obstetrician who uh, does uh, uh, placental research and a comment that he made about the mRNA vaccines is one I think would do us all well to remember, and that is that these this mRNA is a very fragile um, uh, strand, and that's uh, because it's so fragile, once it deposits that protein into the cytoplasm of your cell, it degrades extremely rapidly, and uh, its rapid degradation uh, means that it would be highly unlikely and, and, uh, and, and just almost unimaginable that there would be any long-term effects on the cells, and also because we know that the the vaccine uh, works uh, at least initially uh, locally in the skeletal cells uh, as it begins developing the uh, immune response. So all good reasons to support your past state, your, your second statement. There's a little more information, I think, on the next slide, Mitch, you've got to share with us about this subject. Uh, I think we already covered this again, but just um, as part of the question was talking about immunocompromised individuals. 
Again, no contraindications for them being vaccinated as long as um, the, the whole situation, um, they should be counseled about what we know about the unknown vaccine safety profiles, um, as well as uh, potential for them having a reduced immune response. Doesn't mean they won't have an immune response. It may not be as strong as other individuals, but they, that's the way I approach a lot of things with individuals who are immuno, immunocompromised. Um, they do not have to have um, antibody testing uh, before giving them a vaccination. Uh, also, they need to be reminded that they still need to follow um, guidance in terms of protections, wearing masks and social distancing and, and so forth. So at this time, also, we do not have to revaccinate these individuals. That's not part of the recommendation. Um, you know, again, these individuals may have short-term immunocompromised condition, um, do not have to be revaccinated after they, they regain that, that um, immune, immune system rebuilding. Um, also, uh, on revaccination, that may change over time as we get experience. But right now, the current recommendations from CDC is that you can vaccinate these individuals. You do not have to revaccinate. All right, good information. Let's throw our fifth question up, please. Uh, a patient who received the Pfizer BioNTech vaccine for the first dose can receive the Moderna vaccine for the second dose if it's the only thing that's available. Is that true or is that false? We'll get your answers here. This has been uh, circulating a lot on the uh, news media and on the uh, social media. So we're curious to see what your thoughts on this. Can you switch brands if the other one's not available? And I just point out this is becoming a hot topic because uh, it was announced this week that uh, instead of holding back second doses, the second doses that had been held back are being released into the uh, to the states so that we can increase the number of people getting vaccinated and vaccinate faster. Okay, let's show the results here. All right, false is the answer here that uh, most of our audience believe. And Mitch, it seems to me that that's uh, that that our audience is pretty savvy on this one. What what advice do you have here? So currently, of uh, um, the authorized vaccines, the Moderna and the Pfizer vaccine, uh, require two doses. Um, each dose, while they both are mRNA vaccines, um, you should not be mixing the two vaccines um, in terms of one dose one, one dose dose the other. Um, patients do not need to get each dose from the same provider. So they can get um, one dose of, of Pfizer vaccine from pharmacist A, another dose of Pfizer vaccine from pharmacist B for the second dose. Um, so I, I think the key message here is that don't try, give the patient the same vaccine type in each of the vaccine, vaccine visits. So Dose one and dose two should be from the same brand. If two doses, you inadvertently, the patient gets one and gets a different one on the second, no additional vaccinations need to be given. Count that as a valid vac vaccine. The recommendation from CDC is don't give additional doses, don't restart the regimen. Um, on the next slide. So the next slide, some other information is, again, don't restart vaccination series. Also, make sure you, you understand the difference between the period of time between dose one and dose two of the two authorized vaccines, 21 day and 28 day. 21 day is for the Pfizer uh, BioNTech vaccine, 28 day is for the Moderna vaccine. Again, never restart the regimen if you're outside of the, the time zone. As with any other vaccine, if you give it beyond the, the date for the second dose, it's okay. Don't restart the series. Just give the, the vaccine when you have the opportunity to, to give that. Pref preference is to give it as close to that time. But then another thing that has popped up recently and wanted, we wanted to make everybody aware of is that don't schedule the second vaccination too early. There's a four day grace period that CDC has identified um, to, to be used um, if, um, a patient, you may not, you know, you don't think they're going to come back in. They, they happen. That's only there um, for if you inadvertently give it a little early. That's not the standard for where you start the second dose scheduling. Some automated systems that are scheduling the second doses were using that four-day grace period as the starting time for making appointments. 
That's not what it's meant for. You should start your scheduling of the second dose either at the 21 day or the 28 day point that has been recommended for that second dose vaccination. Very good information, and I'll, uh, I think uh, many of our listeners know that uh, I've been involved with mass vaccination efforts here at our institution, and uh, one of the tips, uh, tricks that I would give to all of you is uh, uh, when you give your patient their immunization card following vaccination, go ahead and schedule their second dose at that time so that they're aware of when they need to return back to your clinic to get immunized. And also to point out that if you have someone who comes to your clinic and says, I'd like to get my second dose, but you weren't the provider that gave the first dose, not only ask for their immunization card, but you should query the state immunization registry to validate and verify the date of receipt of that first dose to make sure that the interval is appropriate. Be sure you've done that. Uh, That's a, a very important step. But uh, we won't have to take that extra work if everyone will bu- will book those second appointments after you finish the first dose and book people in at 21 and 28 days out. That will be ideal and will keep uh, uh, reducing confusion. All right, we've got one more fact-based question that we're going to cover, and then we're going to really jump into our audience questions. The question here is: COVID-19 vaccines can result in false positives on COVID-19 viral tests. Is this true or false? Can COVID-19 vaccines result in false positives on COVID-19 viral tests? All right, you've got to get a few more clicks in here. Thank you, folks. Uh, Your last polling question, appreciate the response. Let's show our results that we have. So the audience decisively thinks that false, these can't result in false positives. Dan, what's truth about this? What do we know about the vaccines and their impact on viral test. Absolutely, so another great question, a common question. Um, and so the answer is that this is, uh, this is false. Uh, there is, COVID-19 vaccines will not cause false positives on COVID-19 viral tests. So uh, there's been a lot of research in this uh, area because of this very question. And uh, according to the CDC, who's looked at this extensively, none of the currently authorized uh, vaccines that are either authorized or under clinical trial um, will cause you to test positive. And so if you think about the way that a lot of these tests work, it, it sort of makes sense. And the way that certainly the vaccines work as well, um, both of the vaccines that are approved are mRNA vaccines. So they're causing your body to manufacture the spike protein uh, of the COVID-19 virus. And that's what our body is reacting to. And so when you look at PCR-based tests, our bodies are not manufacturing genetic material in any way, shape, or form. So there's nothing there for the test to detect. So there's no false positives from that. When you get into the antigen testing, again, um, the antigens that are being looked at do not overlap with what the vaccines are are causing your body to produce. And the quantities of antigens that your bodies are producing are not circulating enough to get into the areas that are tested. So again, if you think about how tests work, you know, they do a nasopharyngeal swab. Those are always fun. The nasal swab, the saliva test. Um, Our bodies are not making so much antigen that they're in those areas in detectable quantities. So uh, it's, there's no evidence out there of false positives resulting from COVID-19 vaccinations. Now, when we turn into uh, antibody tests, so looking to see if someone actually has antibodies against COVID-19, it is quite possible that you would develop an antibody response to the vaccine. That's the whole point of the immunization to begin with. Uh, we want to prime our bodies to be able to produce antibodies when they see the covid antigen in the future. And so uh, there is a very real possibility that an antibody test may come up positive. Uh, But again, that's the intended purpose of the vaccine. So hopefully that clarifies everything. It sounds like our audience is already up to speed on this. Yeah, okay. Uh, Interesting thing is that uh, there there are uh, antibody tests that have been developed and a lot of labs are working on these now to be able to determine whether your positivity is due to vaccine or due to you having been uh, naturally infected. And so I think as we move along and uh, technology continues to advance, there will be the ability, there already is the ability uh, for uh, more advanced laboratories to be able to test and determine whether a person was actually infected uh, with COVID-19 or 
was vaccinated and it's the vaccine that's caused them to uh, produce those antibodies. So interesting science and interesting results. Well, I wanna jump in now and share uh, a lot of information here. Uh, we got some facts that our audience wants to share. Uh, I, I wanna share one uh, story here. Uh, a Massachusetts pharmacist uh, uh, says that they're being offered jobs with a local ambulance company. Uh, in order to help the ambulance company mass vaccinate. In that situation, Elisa, what liability does a pharmacist have if they decide to take a, a position as a mass immunizer with a non-pharmacy organization? That's a great question. Um, so the PrEP Act authority that HHS has given uh, for pharmacists goes to pharmacists and pharmacy technicians and pharmacy interns. And it doesn't necessarily go to the place where you are actually ordering and administering or administering the vaccines. So if you're working with an ambulance company and you're still working within your license, because you have to be a licensed pharmacist, um, then, then that coverage goes with you. But it's also very prudent to ask if you are going to be vaccinating with whatever whatever uh, scenario and whoever it is what kind ask them what kind of liability coverage you have even though you have this prep act authority never it's it's, it's never a problem to have too much uh, liability protection yeah and i you know i always advise pharmacists and always have for my entire career to have a personal liability insurance policy, even if your employer tells you we got you covered, it's probably a good idea to just have personal liability uh, for your own sake. It's not expensive, uh, and so it's very important that you're protected. Uh, but it sounds like uh, uh, our Massachusetts, phar Massachusetts pharmacist would have PrEP Act coverage at least uh, in her situation, so that's good to know. Uh, Mitch, I wanna address a question to you a little bit more on uh, pregnancy. Um, is, is it, are both vaccines, Moderna and the Pfizer product, okay during pregnancy? And then could you just also mention any trimester? Does it matter first, second, or third trimester? Yeah, according to the CDC, the CDC's uh, interim clinical guidance um, covers both vaccines. So, so both of them are looking at um, pregnant individuals. Um, they've been, some of them were, have been included in the clinical trials. And so that's what they're basing on for both the mRNA uh, vaccines. And in terms of, of uh, which trimester, there is no um, preference to any, any trimester. It's more of what the, the uh, individual is comfortable in terms of timing. Again, because as we talked about earlier, this is not a live vaccine. Um, there is no um, specific preference to, to any time in the pregnancy. Now, other things happen during a pregnancy. So, you know, individuals may want to wait until after the first trimester just to make sure everything is going well. With the, with the pregnancy, that's up to the individual's discussion with their clinician. Yeah. Um, Dan, I've got a question for you. Uh, we have a pharmacist uh, who has a relative who tested positive on the FAST antigen test and then had a follow-up negative result on a PCR test. How, how does that happen and how can that be explained? How do you, how do you explain a, te a positive test and then you turn around a few days later and you have a negative test. What What's the ex explanation for that? Yeah, absolutely. So I think there's a lot of different ways that that could happen. Um, probably the most logical would be just the effects of viral clearance. So uh, I saw that question in the chat and there were, I think, you know, seven or eight days it looked like that it passed in between those tests. And so uh, what happens over time is that uh, our bodies are uh, designed to help clear the virus. And so what uh, may have happened is that when that first test was run, there was enough antigen from the virus uh, to test positive. And then a few days later, when they went back to do the PCR test, uh, that patient's body had uh, cleared the virus to the point where it was no longer detectable. So that's probably the most likely scenario given the time frame. Uh, the other reason could simply be some sensitivity uh, issues related to the different tests. Um, each test is more or less sensitive than others. And so it may have been that the viral load in the second test was just below the, the threshold of detection, uh, which uh, would be a good thing either way. So that's probably the, the couple of scenarios that I can think of. There's a lot more, but we won't go into those for the sake of time. So we've gotten a lot of questions from our audience about uh, vaccine safety. Um, 
And um, I'm going to summarize just a couple of these things, and I'm going to point our audience uh, to a resource. Um, there, there's a report on a news station about a 56-year-old doctor in Florida who died two weeks after getting a COVID vaccine. Um, of course, the way that that story was pitched made it sound like the COVID vaccine might have caused the death uh, in an otherwise healthy person. Um, you know, how do we know for sure what happens following vaccination in terms of these effects? A resource I want to point all of our audience to is that last last week on Wednesday, uh, the, the CDC published together with the FDA in MMWR a summary of the safety information from the first roughly 2 million doses of the Pfizer vaccine that have been that have been uh, administered in the U.S. There will be subsequent safety uh, issues published either every other week or so uh, as we come up here on these vaccines in MMWR, so pay very close attention to that. I will tell you that the article discussed the incidence of death <clears throat> in populations who had been vaccinated, and the incidence of death was actually uh, uh, lower than uh, expected in the general population. And so <clears throat> at this point, there is no causal relationship between that incident that we heard about on the news uh, and, uh, and, and the COVID vaccine. So very important to watch this. And, and I think this is a good opportunity for us to also talk about the VSAFE program. Mitch, what is VSAFE for anyone who perhaps hasn't uh, been uh, watching our show? So uh, VSAFE is a program that has been uh, stood up by the, the uh, CDC as an, an, an app to monitor uh, individuals' reactions post-vaccination. So when you are um, administering the vaccine to an individual, um, you should have some kind of, uh, there's a flyer you can print out online, have it available to the patients for information, make them aware of this while they're going through their 15 to 30 minute waiting period post-vaccination. Give them the, the information so that they could go ahead and load it on their app and um, it will give them um, reminders and questions to uh, how they're doing. And it's a way of CDC monitoring um, reactions that individuals may have post-vaccination. So it's part of the um, surveillance processes that the um, federal government has established for, again, we want to get more experience how people are doing and be able to respond. If somebody is having a reaction um, or has had an effect, they, they will be followed up by someone from CDC to get more information. Um, so it's part of the surveillance process with vaccinations and safety. So on the theme of safety, I'm going to uh, let any of our panelists who want to uh, opine on this one. Um, you know, we hear we do hear a lot of concerns uh, among consumers uh, about uh, um, uh, expressing concerns about vaccine safety because the studies happen so quickly. Uh, and, uh, and, and the vaccine came to market uh, pretty quickly. How, what are some effective strategies to address the concerns that consumers have about vaccine safety? So Mitch, I'll, I'll let you start on that. And Dan and Elisa, if you wanna chime in with your thoughts on it as well, we'd love to hear what, you're, what you think about this. So there, there are several talking points that I, I think all of us will probably chime in and, 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 and tell the audience, but one that I've used in the, when I've been asked this question is that the number of individuals who were in the clinical trials are at the same level ha that have been there for other previously approved vaccines, like the shingles vaccine, for example, is one that, that's used. Um, so the number of individuals who've gone through this is, is one talking point. The other is that the steps that were used are, there was no skipping of the steps. The same processes, they were just happening simultaneously that helped speed up the process and we're using platforms that are already known. So we had a lot of information already. I'll turn it over to Dan and Lisa to add more bullets. Yeah, I think um, I think the other thing I would say is um, something that we talked about earlier in the webinar, which is the MMWR report uh, that came out talking about the adverse events after the first 2 million doses. If that, that hopefully tells people that the FDA is taking this very seriously and they are actively monitoring this closely so much so that they're accelerating their reporting out to ensure that the public has the best available information. Uh, so it's not just, you know, we're, we're going through the normal steps. The monitoring is ongoing and continuing and FDA is doing everything in their power to make sure that the public has that information as well. 
All right, Elisa, do you have more you'd like to add? No, I think I really covered it. I mean, to the extent that that the healthcare professionals are, are out there getting the vaccine and demonstrating that that they have confidence in it. And um, that's really important, and hopefully that that carries a lot of weight because uh, you know all these surveys that we've been seeing coming out just in the last few days about how how healthcare professionals, nurses, pharmacists are you know still among the highest trusted professionals you know in in the country. So I think that is helpful. Yeah. Michael, one and one bullet yeah, too. One bullet too that we could add, especially since you know pharmacists are in that tier one A and. And many of us have gotten vaccinated. It's also let's remind people that we're walking the walk, that we are, ourselves are getting vaccinated, and I'm standing here talking to you with no problems. Yeah, well, me too, and uh, I've uh, I've had uh, no no problems so far. Um, I will uh, just also mention to our audience another thing that is uh, I have found to be reassuring to people is that. Uh, there are now over 40 million doses of these vaccines that have been administered globally and safety is being monitored worldwide for these vaccines. And to this point, there have been no significant safety signals of concern that have emerged uh, from the global uh, data safety data network. And so that's very important too. It's not just that these vaccines are being given in the US, Globally, these vaccines have been proven safe as well. So those things I think are reassuring uh, to our patients and when we can point those things out in addition to the data we're collecting at the FDA and, and the CDC, that's very, very helpful. So I just would point that out as well. Um, the question here, do, do the antigens from the vaccine stay localized in the muscle cells at the point of injection, Dan, or do they go throughout your body and uh, produce uh, antibodies everywhere? How, how does that work? Yeah, that, that's a great question. Um, the, the answer is that uh, they do tend to stay somewhat localized. So they don't, uh, for the most part, many of those proteins will stay in the muscle cells, um, but some of them are uh, externalized, and that's how our immune system is able to recognize them. Uh, if it stayed internally only, our immune system would not be able to recognize those antigens. So they do make it outside of the cell. Um, and the, the question is, is what quantity is out there? Um, that that kind of helps determine how far it spreads. And we, we I have not seen any data that really talks about uh, the quantity uh, of antigen produced or how far it spreads. Um, but because of the way our immune systems work, uh, it doesn't necessarily need to spread throughout your whole body. Um, that's one of the amazing things about our immune system. It can pick up a signal that's localized and then grab that immunity, develop the immunity, and that immunity can then spread throughout our body so that we're able to uh, attack the virus where it would live again, typically in the points of entry, uh, and then from there it would spread further. So um, it's really interesting science, and we can talk about that in more detail at uh, maybe a later time. If um, if a mother is vaccinated during pregnancy, does uh, antibody get transferred to the fetus? Uh, do we know uh, anything about that yet, uh, Mitch or Dan? And you want to take it or? Yeah, I haven't seen anything uh, that looks specifically at antibodies in, in the fetus and, and maternal transfer, whether that crosses the placenta or not. Uh, so I think still to be determined. Yeah, I, I was going to just uh, uh, echo what you said. You know, the vaccine, um, there were some people who became pregnant after entering into the studies. Uh, and uh, those uh, individuals are being tracked, but they've obviously not come to term yet, and so their babies haven't been born, and we don't know. I think there are academic researchers across the country that are interested in this research question, and we'll be looking into it, but at this point, uh, we don't know the definitive answer to the question about whether uh, those antibodies are passed to the fetus. We do know that, generally speaking, maternal antibodies are passed to the fetus, but we don't know anything about the protective effects of those antibodies uh, and so forth. The good news is, is that COVID-19 uh, tends to cause a fairly mild course of illness in uh, infants and children. And so that's the good news. But uh, stay tuned on this. There, there will likely be more information about this in the future. But right now, we don't know a lot on this subject. So uh, can a patient donate plasma? Uh, if they receive 
the COVID vaccine. Can you still donate blood if you uh, receive the COVID vaccine? What's uh, uh, your thoughts on this? Anybody have the answer to that question? So the answer is yes, you can. <laughs> you can donate blood. And in fact, our uh, local blood banks here in Southern California have sent out alerts. If you've had the COVID vaccine, we will still take your blood. We still want you to donate blood. They're, they're very interested in having uh, uh, the blood supply not be declining because people are getting vaccinated. So you can get, uh, you can give blood. So that's very important. And we look at rich blood, Michael. Say it again. That can be looked at as enriched blood. That's right. That's exactly right. That's exactly right. Okay, this is really an important question. So someone gets vaccinated, um, and let's say we're two, three, four weeks out from the second dose of the vaccine, so we're going to assume you're 95% protected based on what we've learned from the studies. Can we transmit virus uh, to someone else? And what do we know about this? This is a concept called nasal carriage, the ability to carry a virus in your nasopharynx, even though you may have been immune personally because of uh, vaccination. What do we know about this, Dan? Uh, can you carry this virus and spread it to somebody else, even if you've been vaccinated? So I think I'll start off by saying that I think we still need to do a lot more research into this to, to fully know the answer. But I think, yes, the answer is yes. Uh, so if you think about the way that the, our bodies respond when we're exposed to a pathogen, uh, when you are exposed, typically the antibody response, if you've already built it up, in, in this case, if you've been vaccinated, uh, can take anywhere between two to as many as five or six and sometimes even longer uh, days. And so during that time, the virus is in your body replicating. And so there's a possibility that even though you will not become clinically ill because the virus won't have a chance to uh, replicate to the point where it causes illness, uh, you could potentially still pass it on to others because it is in your uh, nasal passages and your nasal pharynx. And uh, through spreading respiratory droplets, you could potentially pass it on to someone else. So I think um, that's, you know, mechanistically how that can happen. And I think we need more data to really help understand better um, what type of protection the vaccine offers and how quickly uh, we're able to suppress that viral load to the point where transmission is not possible or very unlikely. Yeah, and I will tell you that uh, Moderna did announce publicly in their FDA hearing for their EUA that uh, they are studying this question. They, they have actually studies going on right now to examine this very question, and uh, it would be a huge game changer if it did, in fact, prevent uh, transmission. But as uh, Dan said, for now, we have to assume that it doesn't and that we have to continue to mask and uh, social distance and do all of those things. So um, let, let me ask the number one question today, and this might be surprising for our audience. The most frequently asked question we've had today is about Bell's palsy. Uh, I've got a half a dozen or more questions about Bell's palsy. Uh, what do we know about the vaccine uh, causing Bell's palsy? And what about if a person has previously had Bell's palsy, does it increase their risk of having a, a reaction with uh, Bell's palsy following vaccination? Uh, Mitch, why don't you start us out on this? And Dan, if you want to expound, you can. So what we know is, is that, you know, we've had a couple of reported cases, as you said, with Bell's palsy. Um, but the FDA does not consider uh, these to be above this, the frequency that we see in the, in the general population. And they they've haven't concluded that the cases were caused by the vac vaccine. Um, and so they're continuing to study it. It is a reportable thing that they're tracking um, as part of the, the V-SAFE program and other surveillance programs. If it does occur that, you know, people should be uh, reporting those. But right now, it's not a contraindication to, to vaccination. Um, whether you've, uh, re you've had Bell's palsy uh, to be vaccinated or, or the risk of Bell's palsy. Uh, Dan, anything more to add? All right. Yeah, so uh, again, the, the data are inconclusive on Bell's palsy, and I would encourage everybody to look at the studies because in one of the studies, the Bell's palsy cases actually occurred more frequently in the um, uh, in the placebo group, uh, and the other one it occurred with more frequency in the in the uh, a vaccine recipient group. So this is why we're so inconclusive about this. 
it's continuing to be monitored and it's mentioned actually in last week's MMWR, which I referred to earlier. I wanna go ahead and clarify two quick things that have come up that seem to be points of confusion among the audience. And we don't wanna have any confusion when we move on now to our association information update. Uh, the first thing is that second dose need, uh, needs to ideally be given on day 21 or day 28, depending on which product you've received. And, and there's a lot of concern about, well, what if that's just not possible to get it on that day? Well, you know, delaying the, you know, getting it the next day or the next day is okay. If it's a little late, it's okay. And, and if there's no other possibility and you have to give it one or two days early, then that's okay too, if it's just not possible to do it any other way. So, so there's flexibility. Um, don't be rigid with it. Give them their appointment for 21 or 28 days. But if it doesn't work out and you need to get the appointment a day or two earlier, a day or two later, okay, no worries. Just be sure that you're within those windows. That's very important. And then the second thing to just very much clarify uh, is this issue of, okay, that we, we had Pfizer doses for dose one, but for whatever reason, our supply has been interrupted and we can't get it in time to give the dose twos, but I've got, you know, thousands of doses of the Moderna product. Why can't I give these people a Moderna vaccine? Well, it hasn't been studied. We don't have scientific evidence to show that doing that will produce the same immune response. And so as a result of that, we have no idea if we're leaving the person unprotected or, or less protected, or if they're equally for, we just don't know. And remember, you don't ever have to restart the series. So if there's a delay in getting the second dose in, yes, you may leave the person less protected for a period of time, but based on the science currently, we need to wait and give the same product when we have it available. And then uh, also just remind you of what Elisa said earlier. If you want that liability protection under the PEP and PREP Act, you have to follow the emergency use authorization. We don't have the flexibility as healthcare providers, as pharmacists uh, to make a decision like that to interchange the vaccine. We would lose our protection or you would lose your protection under the PEP and PREP Act if you tried to engage in that activity. So I wanna be very clear about that with everybody so there's no confusion. All right, I am going to thank our panelists for our Q&A. We've covered a lot of things. Now, Mitch, there's some late breaking, uh, well, I won't say late breaking, kind of late breaking since our last webinar, information from the CDC about pharmacies and immunizations. Let's talk a little bit about that. Would you walk us through this beautiful chart, which is in everybody's slides for reference later? Right. And so this slide is in your, in your, your reference as well as it'll be on the APHA uh, website by the end of this week as well. Um, so CDC... Um, in working with the states has stood up a new, a, an additional program for engaging um, pharmacies that are in, in the federal um, contract network. It's called a jurisdiction transfer. So it, in, in helping get pharmacies engaged earlier than in phase two, where there's an abundance of supply available, they have offered to the states making that network available earlier so where the states could, could engage pharmacies who are in the federal program for their, their needs in the state. And so they're working with the states to identify providers on that network who will be able to get allocation from the state supply to do vaccination for individuals in tier 1B and tier 1C. Um, and so this chart lays out the differences. It's controlled by the states. The states will determine which pharmacy providers in the federal network they will use. It'll be a a slowly implemented process because vaccine supply is still limited um, at the state level. And so that is, will eventually, the goal, as we talked about earlier, is for all of pharmacies and other providers who are willing, ready, and able to vaccinate to have access when supply can support that. But for right now, the states have an ability to actually tap in to these federal contract pharmacies that wouldn't have to go through a separate state enrollment process but they need to be identified and vaccine supply allocations transferred from the state allocation to these pharmacies that are in the federal contract. Um, take a long time going through this. This chart lays it out. Um, if you have questions, feel free to reach out to us after the conference. 
All right, and Elisa, you have some information to share with us about what's going on at the federal level. Yes, yeah, thank you. And this actually just came out this morning um, from HHS's Office of the General Counsel. Um, for those of you who have been on our weekly webinars, knows that we've been talking a lot about the PREP Act and what is the PREP Act. It, it, it's a law that allows the secretary in, in the case of pharmacists and pharmacy technicians and interns, uh, the, the secretary has given uh, us authority to order and administer tests, vaccines, and childhood vaccines. And there's been some question over, and in order to get this immunity or liability protection um, for ordering and administering, the pharmacist or technician or intern has to follow certain requirements that were outlined in the authority. And one of the requirements is that, that it must be ordered, this is the COVID-19 vaccine, it must be ordered and administered according to the advisory committee of immunization practices recommendations and there's been concerns and questions about what does that really mean um, and does it mean that you need to follow the ACIP allocation or priority recommendations and that's where some confusion has has risen and what this new uh, opinion really specifies is that it means that the vaccine must be one that ACIP recommends for the prevention of COVID-19. It doesn't mean that it needs to be administered pursuant to any particular allocation guidance or priority. And this, this is really important to clarify because as you know, in states, although ACIP has put forward, ACIP from the federal government has put, put forward some recommendations, states, are coming up with different allocations and priorities. And so what this really says is, as long as what you're administering is an ACIP recommended vaccine, right now we just have the Pfizer-BioNTech and the Moderna, and you're following all of the, the requirements that you will get the protection under the PrEP app, regardless of whether it was ordered or administered to someone not in an ACIP prioritized group. So this is really helpful um, clarification coming out of HHS uh, that a lot of states, jurisdictions, and, and pharmacists have been asking. So um, hope that's clear. If you have any questions, you know how to reach us um, at, 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 uh, FD, at APHA. So from FDA, some other news that's been coming out, there have been a lot of questions, concerns about the, the Pfizer vial says that I could get six doses. Moderna says I could get 10 doses. And in fact, for Pfizer, it was originally five doses that could be drawn. Uh, and based on a lot of feedback, the, the, the approval, the EUA um, and labeling says now six doses can come out. But what we're seeing and hearing is that's variable. And what FDA came out with uh, guidance and said, use low dead volume syringes or needles to extract that sixth dose from a single vial. And, and what is a low dead space syringe? I, I actually a pharmacist for 30 some years, I didn't know. Um, it's a syringe that has, the dead space is the area between the syringe hub and the needle where product could just hang out and it can't be extracted or drawn up. So if you use a lower dead space volume, so there's less of that that volume or space for product to hang out, you can get more dose out of the vial. And so, um, and then they also, as we talked about earlier, um, that, you know, in terms of you need to follow the requirements that are in the um, EUA and the labeling. And if you only have a little bit of one vial and a little bit in another vial, you should not be pooling that. You should not be combining it. That will break the um, sterility and cause some, um, increase the risks. Let's go to the next slide. Um, actually, I just want to uh, remind everybody, for those of you who, um, who have been on these webinars, know that almost every week we put out at APHA new Know Your Facts or Know the Facts resources for pharmacists. They're available on our website. You do not have to be a member, but 
um, we we hope that you all would be members in order to get this um, as well and to benefit from it. But we um, are putting out a new resource specific to that previous issue that I just talked about and um, related to the, the dead space and the syringes. We're also in the process of putting out a new resource, um, updating the um, reimbursement for administration and with new information for billing. And that's that's been an issue that we've gotten a lot of questions, hearing a lot of information from pharmacists who are getting their claims rejected. And we will be updating um, the our resource with late breaking information on how to minimize um, those rejects. I think it's back to um, you, Michael. Th thank you so much, Elisa. Appreciate that information. Now, if you're not a part of APHA's Engage Community for COVID-19, you are missing out because there are some fantastic conversations that have been happening there uh, with members sharing uh, details and information and answering each other's questions, and we'd encourage you to be a part of that. We also want to let you know that uh, next time, uh, next week on Thursday, January 21st, uh, we will be partnering with the American Association of Colleges of Pharmacy to discuss how student pharmacists can help uh, enhance our vaccination efforts in local communities. And so you won't want to miss that. It'll be a partnership between APHA and AACP uh, for next week's show. And I believe that we have reached the end of our broadcast. We thank you for joining us this week for what was a very engaging conversation about the myths and facts of COVID vaccine. We look forward to having you join us next week at the same time and same place. Uh, for all of you, I wish you the very best as you engage in your efforts to vaccinate America, and we wish you Godspeed. Have a great day.